Heavenly Father, your faithfulness is great. And we would cry out, let all the world be found a liar, and you remain faithful. You remain true. You keep your promises. You stick to your plans and your purposes. You do not violate your own character. And that is our hope. You are reliable. You are a sure anchor for our soul. And it is in you and in you alone we have our hope, our faith, our confidence, our trust. We thank you that you do not change, you do not waver, but you are the rock of our salvation. God, we pray as we come to your word right now that you would be pleased to soften our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes. Let us heed what you have here for us. May your love for your church bleed over into our own hearts, our own affections, our own lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What a sweet morning we have already had together. Being together, singing praises, a little foretaste of heaven, hearing from God's word, not only in equipping hour and our communion meditation, but in song together. We've been instructing one another in these songs. The unity of the church is precious. A unity around the truth. There is a phony kind of unity that's attainable when two people look at each other and make compromises and meet somewhere in the middle. But there is a true unity in Jesus Christ when we together look toward him. And the closer we get toward him and his truth, the closer we find ourselves to each other. And this kind of unity is the unity God has in mind for the church. And it is precious. It is also precarious. It's precarious because of us. It is easy for us to disrupt this unity in the body. There is, in fact, a clear and present danger to the sweet and precious unity in the truth in the local church. Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes coined the phrase clear and present danger in 1919 U.S. Supreme Court case Schenck versus the United States. There was the threat in wartime that people speaking freely could sabotage U.S. war efforts. The phrase clear and present danger came to describe seditious words spoken or published during wartime that posed an imminent threat to the survival of the country. We're in the midst of a conversation even now about First Amendment rights and trying speech. We have prized the First Amendment of the United States as a protection of the freedoms to say anything that we want to say. And yet we recognize the tension that some words are problematic, injurious, even a threat to our very livelihoods. That debate is hot even in uh, these moments. But in the church, in the church of Jesus Christ, where unity around the truth is prized, is there such a thing as First Amendment protection of freedom of speech? Are you free in Christ to say anything that comes to mind, no matter how injurious it might be to a brother or sister in the Lord? Well, of course not. Read James 1 and James 3 and the entire book of Proverbs, and we find very quickly that the Lord has expectations on how we treat one another with our words. In fact, if any man could tame the tongue, he'd be a perfect man, says James. Words can have a destructive influence. Words can be a wrecking ball to the precious but precarious commodity of Christian unity in the church. The passage we're looking at this morning will reveal for us a clear and present danger to unity in the church and will also prescribe for us protection and some measures of remedy for those dangers. What is the main point of the passage that we're looking at this morning? It is Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. And the main idea is that Paul interrupts his final greetings in this letter with an urgent appeal for protection and preservation of unity in the local church. Let's read together this text. Paul says, Now I urge you, brethren, 
Keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. What is on display here is an interruption of Paul's final greetings for an urgent appeal for prevention and remedy for this clear and present danger of the disruption of unity in the church. In the first 16 verses of this last chapter of the letter to the Roman churches, Paul has extensively sent greetings. Greet 26 people plus groups plus a commendation for one choice servant, name after name after name of warm, affectionate, fond greetings. Paul says over and again, they are my beloved. They are faithful workers in the Lord. Greet them. And then finally, he closes out that section with greet one another with a holy kiss. The warm, affectionate greeting of love in the body of Christ. He will go on later in this chapter in verses 21 and following to say, Timothy greets you, churches at Rome, and others with Paul send their greetings. And sandwiched right in between these two sets of greetings, Paul puts forth a group of people to not greet, to not welcome, to not commend. No holy kiss, no warm affections, but a different response altogether. We're going to look at this urgent appeal in three portions. The first is that Paul identifies this ever-present threat to the church. Look at this in verse 17. Paul says, now I urge you, and there is an urgency in this urging. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned. This is an ever-present threat, and Paul describes this threat in generic terms. Keep your eye on those who. He doesn't name names here. He names names in other places with more specified threats. This one's generic. It's whoever does this, whoever it might be, wherever they turn up, whenever they come. Many attempts have been made to identify the specific group that Paul might have in mind in this chapter. I don't think he has a specific group in mind. I don't believe he has a specific threat to the Roman church in view. I don't believe it's the Judaizers. Many people have tried to identify this as the threat of the Judaizers. Those are those Jews who rejected Christianity or those Jews who had partially embraced some things of Christianity and tried to infiltrate the church and make them follow Mosaic law. Make them follow law as a way to be right before a holy God. And and you and I know, and the Apostle Paul has made clear, that there is no way to heaven by keeping rules. Why? Because no one ever has and no one ever could keep the rules, no matter whatever rules you put in place. And and any attempt to try to keep rules to get to heaven will only bring you to the lake of fire and judgment. As you stand before God with your stinking pile of human-made garbage called religion or law-keeping or anything else, and say, God, look what I've done for you. You have to accept me. And he says, get out of here. The only thing that God will accept at the doorway to heaven is the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, his son, brought through the cross of Christ for all who would embrace it by faith alone. Judaizing evangelism, Judaizing influence would have been a threat to the very gospel Paul proclaims. And you know that the Judaizers hounded Paul everywhere he went in his ministry, but we learn from Acts 28 that they had not yet reached Rome. When Paul finally shows up at Rome, he goes first to the synagogues and addresses the Jewish unbelieving leadership and begins to preach the gospel to him. And they said, we haven't heard about you. We've heard about this sect that follows Jesus and that it's spoken ill of, but we haven't heard about you yet. And so the Judaizers hadn't got to Rome. That's not the threat. I don't believe there are any particular false teachers named. No specific teaching is identified. And I believe that Paul's heads up here for us is helpful in its lack of specificity because factious people and divisive teachings have shown up in many flavors. 
they, they showed up in many flavors during Paul's own ministry. They have shown up in many flavors since all the way down to this day. The general warning is instructive for us. The threat to the precious truth unity in the church is an ever-present danger. It's not tied to one false teacher in the first century, but as a regular threat. Paul identifies this danger as those who cause dissensions and hindrances. And we will label these this morning the dismantling of unity and the departure from the truth. Paul is warning the Roman believers about people who, first of all, dismantle the unity of the church. They cause dissensions. This is a word which has to do with being in a state of factious opposition. You know, when water seeps into the crags of a rock and then freezes, it expands and breaks the rock. We're talking about people that get in and find fractures and drive a wedge and split churches. People who cause divisions. In fact, the opposite of this word in Greek is the word harmony. And Galatians 5.20 identifies dissensions as one of the deeds of the flesh. And Proverbs 6 says it even more dramatically. There are, there are things which Yahweh hates. And in verse 19 of Proverbs 6, he lists one of those as one who spreads strife among brothers. God hates it. And the goal of one who brings about dissensions, whether stated or whether in a subversive manner, is to break away and take people with them, or even to create coalitions and parties within a local church. You can have divisions which break off people altogether and take them away, or you can have divisions and party lines within a church that separate love, brother to brother and sister to sister in Christ that bring about a fracturing of unity around the truth in love. Paul warns about people who dismantle the unity of the church and then people who are a departure from the truth. They bring about an apostasy or a walking away from the truth. He says here in verse 17, there are hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned. And the word hindrances is simply the word for stumbling blocks where we get our English word for scandal. It means something that trips you up. And the way this word is used in the New Testament typically drives at an ultimate, an ultimate destruction and demise of spiritual life leading to judgment. To be tripped up by a scandal in these ways is to be tripped up over the truth claims of Christ and your own spiritual vitality in such a way that professing believers would walk away from Christ. These are real threats to the livelihood of the church. Paul calls them hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned. He's not speaking just about the letter to the Romans that he's just written, that they're reading here. By the time they get to chapter 16, oh, you mean everything from chapter 1 to 15? No, he's talking about apostolic doctrine the truth contained in the New Testament that was the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the New Testament teaching and the implications of the saving work of Jesus Christ. It was all of the implications for Christian living and for future hope. And then Paul references this very thing in Romans chapter 6, verse 17, in terms of our freedom from slavery to sin and our newfound life in Christ in slavery to Jesus. Listen to Romans 6, 17. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you are committed. Again, he's talking to Roman believers whom he has never met. He's never been to that church. And he's saying, this is the teaching to which you were entrusted. And now there are the potential for stumbling blocks, people who become hindrances contrary to that teaching which you learned. This is the scandal of heterodoxy, that is, different teachings, other teachings. It's not just that it's abject falsehood, 180 degrees out of the truth, but as Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.3, it is simply the teaching of other things, strange doctrines, people who are teaching off the map of the New Testament, bringing in other teachings. And it is a scandal, a stumbling block, and a a potential hindrance 
to the church. And you see, when a thousand ideas are present, each making a claim, each competing to have a voice, the truth can be drowned out in a cacophony of sounds. This is really the problem of the information age, isn't it? You you try to go find an answer to something and you're bombarded with a thousand answers, a million answers, a Google answers. I meant that as a number. The voice of biblical truth becomes a needle in a haystack of information. And what the church needs is a unity around the voice of Jesus Christ, the clear teaching of the New Testament, apostolic doctrine. And the scandal that's in view here is not limited to information. There is also the potential of moral scandal, that is, teaching or behavior or example that leads people to sin. And this really is the inducement to apostasy and ultimately to spiritual ruin. The first portion of this appeal for protection and preservation of unity in the church is the identification of this ever-present threat. The second portion of Paul's urgent appeal here is a command for a fitting Christian response. Paul gives a command here. Notice what he says in verse 17, I urge you, brethren, and then he gives two parts to this command, keep your eye on them and turn away from them. Keep your eye on them and turn away from them. Mark them out and shun them. This is a Christian response. Notice what Paul says at the beginning of the verse. Now I urge you, brethren. He's not talking to seminary professors. He's not talking to regional uh, committees. He's not talking specifically here to the pastors of a church. Excuse me. You for a second. Actually, grab me a water. Oh, you already did it. That was quick. Thank you. (laughs) Pardon me for a moment. Okay, there's your thematic transition to point number two. Here we go. (laughs) Dramatic, that's what I should have said. The Christian response is to mark them out and shun them. I encourage you, therefore, brothers, is a command to every Christian. First of all, Christians are to mark them out, to put your scope on them, to keep your eye on them, to pay careful attention to them, train your optics on this threat to the church. And you know, in our love of unity, in our love of being together and enjoying our fellowship together, we can unwittingly undermine true unity in the church. The book of Romans has been commanding us towards kindness and love and preferring one another, right? A dying to self that is part of the working out of what it means to be under the reign of grace, to be a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, dying to self and living for the benefit of others, Right, And we love that. But that can make us unwilling to deal forcefully, righteously, biblically with real threats to the church if our guard is not up. We want to be kind to one another. I want to be kind to everybody. And so a factious person comes into the church, I want to be kind to him too. (laughs) Termites are a real and present danger to homes in Arizona. You're nodding because you've paid the bills for termite damage repair, or maybe you've bought the subscription. I just let mine expire, and I found another termite. That's bad news. Termites do damage unseen. And by the time you find it, the damage has been done in invisible ways behind the walls, in the structure of your home, in ways you wish you could have seen early on. The other thing I've learned about termites is that they, they if, you, if you haven't got termites yet, you one day will if you live in Arizona. Uh, and if you eradicate termites in your home, they live in these huge underground layers. Do you know where they go? To your neighbor's house. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. <laughs> your 
John Calvin said this, through our neglect or want of care, wicked men do great harm in the church before they are ever opposed, and they creep in with astonishing subtlety for the purpose of doing mischief unless they be carefully watched. So this requires a, a balanced mindset in the heart of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. So every Christian must learn to discern. To not give up on kindness and brotherly love and a welcoming spirit in the life of the church. To greet one another with a holy kiss and to have your eyes open for those who cause dissensions. Christians are to mark them out. Secondly, Christians are to shun them. That is, turn them away. Avoid them. Don't have contact. Don't have pleasant conversations. To disassociate from them. To censure them. To cancel them. To protect the precious unity of the church. A number of years ago, I took a spill over some sideline bleachers and put a little hole in my shin. And two weeks later, my leg swelled up so large I couldn't find my knee or my ankle or anything in between. It was a long, large, swollen tube of hot flesh. It was gangrenous. And when I made my way to the emergency room, I got yelled at by every medical worker who said, what are you doing? Why didn't you come in sooner? Well, I'm here. I said, you got a lot of necrotic tissue here. What's that? It, it's all dead flesh. We need to cut off your leg. Unless the antibiotics work, and they pumped me full of antibiotics. Thankfully, they did work. <laughs> After a heavy dose of fear and antibiotics, they scooped out. Never mind, I'll pass up the illustration. <laughs> Gangrene is bad. And it spreads, and it will kill you unless you remove it. Dangerous to a body. This is why Paul told Titus in Titus 3.10, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. And the apostle John wrote in 2 John 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, that is, he went too far and doesn't abide in the teaching of Christ, don't receive him into your house. Don't give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. And you say, well, isn't that kind of intolerant? Yes. Yes. Uh, doctors are intolerant of gangrenous tissue. I'm intolerant of termites. And Christians who love the church are to be intolerant of those things which would bring about a fractious division and destruction to the church. And we're commanded here to be intolerant of that which threatens Jesus' bride. How could you truly love what's beautiful and simultaneously endure what destroys it? Look, I would love to hear Vivaldi's Four Seasons played loud and live by a skilled symphony orchestra, all strings. And you know what? I'd be okay if a rookie tuba player showed up and improv right in the middle of the winter largo, like the best part of the whole deal. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Think about a masterpiece by Van Gogh or Bob Ross. <laughs> I'm a tolerant person, so it's okay if a kid walks into the Louvre with some finger paints and finds the best Bob Ross painting in the Louvre. No, Bob Ross is not in the Louvre. And a kid makes a few additions here and there to the masterpieces. We're okay with that, right? And if it's a Bob Ross painting, he would have to make some happy additions, wouldn't he? No, if we love the sweet unity of Christ's church and we're focused on his glory and we're proclaiming together his truth, then we must be intolerant of insidious dangers that threaten to destroy it. When I was in grad school, I was in a very solid church. But there always seemed to be young men who talked often about the ways that they disagreed with the pastors of the church how they took a different interpretation on this thing or that thing, how they held a different view. And they seemed far more ready to talk about those differences than about all the things they supposedly agreed with in the church. And I remember wondering a few times, bro, why are you even at this church? And they seemed to wear their disagreement with the pastor like a badge of courage or a mark of their discernment skills. 
I didn't like being around those guys. I was there to learn. I was growing like a weed. I needed truth. I didn't want to be drawn away to an infinite abyss of doubt and disunity because some young gun was trying to gain a following for his own fleshly desires. I couldn't put a finger on it at the time. It was distasteful to me then, and I didn't want any part of it. But since then, I have seen those same young men grow old and drift far afield of the truths that they once held. So Paul says, be on the lookout and shun such men. Again, this is normal Christian activity, this command in verse 17. It's the duty of every run-of-the-mill Christian. Pastors as shepherds must do this, of course, to protect the sheep. But pastors must also equip every Christian to be able to discern a factious, divisive character. The third portion of Paul's urgent appeal here for protection and preservation of unity in the church is his provision of a revealing explanation. Paul provides a revealing explanation. He's going to tell us why this is so important, and the explanation for why this is so important has to do with the character of the factious man, the character of the divisive influence. First of all, he wants us to know that such infiltrators are themselves enslaved. Look what he says in verse 18. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. They're enslaved. Number one, don't go following after somebody who's a slave to his own appetites. They're going somewhere, and where they're going is not good. We don't follow that. And this is a revealing explanation. They, they are not serving Christ. Contra their appearances... Right? Paul's not talking here about Richard Dawkins, some atheist on PBS who's saying there is no God. He's talking about people in the church who are creating division and fractions because they're appealing. Full of God talk, but they are self-serving. Listen, the Lord Jesus is head of the church, Ephesians 4. That we are to grow up in truth and love into the maturity that is measured by our conformity to Christ who is the head. That's how our maturity is measured, by unity in the truth. And Jesus unifies the members of the church. These infiltrators work contrary to Christ, and they divide his church. What are they serving if they're not serving our Lord Christ? Paul says in verse 18, they are serving their own appetites. Literally, they're serving their bellies. They are serving themselves. And again, this is a generic warning, but I think not only in the New Testament, but also in church history, we've seen a variety of categories of bellies, of what it is, what appetites there are that are being served. The first category might be something like personal ambition, rank, status, notoriety, fame, having a voice, having followers. The Judaizers in the first century would be of this category. Hey, we want you to follow us. We're telling you how to eat. We're telling you you must be circumcised. You got to keep our rules. There's position and power and wrong kinds of influence in that desire. And some people crave that. That's what they want to eat. Paul warns about them in Galatians 5. Or, Or maybe the false apostles in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul warns about. They want to be esteemed. They want people to like them and to give them a place of honor. A second category would be perhaps some financial benefit. These are mercenary false teachers seeking great temporal gain through godliness, through so-called godliness, through religion. And people have certainly made a living out of that in the 20th century, the modern-day TV preacher. Send in your money is the theme of the ministry. A third category would be sensual appetites, immoral living, licentious living. Wrong doctrine, by the way, will eventually produce wrong living, but often wrong doctrine proclaimed is an outward indicator of an inward rottenness 
of an immorality, a secret immorality that's already in place. In fact, if you read the New Testament and just catalog all the descriptions of false teachers, they are nearly always connected with bad living and influential bad living. An example that bleeds out on other people and leads other people to licentious rejection of God's truth and God's way of living. It is a leaven that leavens the whole lump and must be removed. They view themselves as Christians, but they are truly serving self. Listen to Paul's assessment in Philippians chapter 3. He says, For many walk, of whom I have often told you, and now I tell you even weeping. Right, so here in Philippians 3, we go from a warning, sort of a general idea that these kinds of guys exist, to weeping over the reality that they are there present uh, infecting the church at Philippi. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. What does that mean? I mean, they're proclaiming Christ. They're proclaiming Christ crucified. They're in the church. They're welcomed into the church at Philippi as teachers and leaders. And Paul has to warn the Philippian church about them. Not because they've rejected Christ or talk about the cross, but they've rejected what it means to suffer with Christ. They, they've rejected a Jesus of suffering and a Jesus following of a life of suffering. The false teachers at Philippi were telling the people, you can have Jesus and you can have the world. You can actually enjoy sexual immorality because you're forgiven. And so they become enemies of the cross of Christ. What does Paul say about them? Their glory is in their shame, shameful deeds, and they're boasting in it. It's their glory. And they set their minds on earthly things. Whatever temporal pleasures are allowed, that's really where their appetites are. This is similar to the Nicolaitan heresy. Jesus said about it in Revelation 2.6 in the letter to the church at Ephesus, I hate the Nicolaitans. Those are strong words from Jesus. And then he commends the Ephesian church and says, you hate the Nicolaitans also. I commend you. Is that a Christian attitude? Yes. <laughs> Who are the Nicolaitans? Tragically, Quite possibly, they were disciples of Nicholas, who first shows up in Acts chapter 6 as one of the proto-deacons serving the widows, uh, the Greek widows around the table fellowship in Jerusalem in the first church. It's quite possible that Nicholas goes awry and leads others and gets followers and a whole movement named after him. Listen to what Jesus says to the church at Pergamum. Concerning them, I have a few things against you, church at Pergamum, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some in the same way holding the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Do you understand what the teaching of the Nicolaitans was? You can have Jesus and sexual immorality. Do you remember the story of Balaam and Balak? Balaam was a prophet, an unbeliever, whom, by the way, God used to speak truth, and in such a way that he couldn't get away from speaking the truth. Whatever Yahweh commanded me, that's what I have to say, and he couldn't do otherwise. And when Balaam couldn't get the children of Israel to defect from God by prophetic utterance and cursing, you know how he got them? Sexual immorality. Send them a bunch of sexual temptations, and then they'll walk from Yahweh, and the people did. That's the teachings of the Nicolaitans in the church at Pergamum, attempting to infiltrate the church at Ephesus. Jesus hates it. Christians are to hate it. Listen, these infiltrators are not fundamentally loyal to Christ. And you would wish that they would just leave the church. Look, if you don't love Jesus, if you don't love eternal things, if you love temporal things, well, look, there's another place in town you can go. Why come here? Why stay here? Why would they want to stay in the church and conform it to their own lusts? Because inside the church, they can find people that feed their egos, satisfy their appetite for attention. They can find followers. 
not only are these infiltrators enslaved to their own appetites, but secondly, they also skillfully ensnare others. Look at verse 18. By their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. They're not honest. They don't say, I really want people to be loyal to me rather than to Christ. Come follow me. They don't say out loud, I'm jealous of the attention that people give to the leadership. They don't say, I want to have a platform. I want to have prestige and power and influence. Come to me. They don't say out loud, I like the sound of my own voice and I want you to like it too. They don't say out loud, I don't really care about the consequences of my pride in the lives of other people. And yet, what do they produce? Different teachings, moral calamity, factions in the church, the disruption of the sweet unity that the truth of Christ creates in the church. They're not honest. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. It's possible they are deceived deceivers. The unsuspecting here literally is a word that just means the not bad. The not bad. It's a word used one other time in the New Testament to describe the innocence of Christ. It was used in Greek literature to describe innocence or someone who is guileless. It doesn't have a bad bone in his body type of idea. The naive. People in the church who don't think this way, how can I influence other people so they start following me instead of Jesus? Most of you don't think that way. That category doesn't even occur to your minds because you love Christ and you say like John the Baptist, I would rather decrease and him increase. I'm okay to be forgotten. (laughs) I actually would rather be invisible and let people see Jesus. And such people haven't thought through the category that there might be somebody in our midst who thinks differently, who has a different attitude about things. And so they are unsuspecting. I don't think that way. Why would other people think that way? I don't walk around scheming up ways to get people to pay attention to me rather than Christ. Why would somebody walk in and want to disrupt the unity of the church? Who who would want to break up the church? Who, Who would want to dismantle God's people from one another and from the truth of Christ? You don't have ulterior motives, and so it's hard to imagine that other people might indeed have the desire to subvert the truth for their own gain. And we're gullible. We're susceptible to be deceived by such people. People who don't think like these infiltrators are susceptible to being deceived by them. If we're not equipped to be aware that such people exist. What is the method of these factious people? By smooth and flattering speech. Smooth speech is plausible speech. That sounds pretty good. Hey, that's a good argument. Okay, yeah, that's different. I've never heard that before, but that's compelling. Fine-sounding arguments, Paul calls them in Colossians 2.4. And then flattering speech is literally good words. These are words that are well-chosen, finely crafted, but untrue. The English word we get from the word here is our word eulogy. Isn't that interesting? How how many well-crafted speeches are made at funerals that are not true? Probably a good word. These people are good at rhetoric, they're clever at argumentation, they're pleasing in their wording. It doesn't sound dangerous, it sounds plausible, it sounds good, it's God talk, lots of comfortable truth mixed in to make their words sound sweet and reasonable. There is a show of holiness, a show of godliness, but not truly aimed at God's glory, certainly not selfless, not motivated by love for God's precious truth, nor God's precious people. I want to get my idea out there regardless of the effect that it has on others. Jesus said in Matthew 17 that false prophets are ravenous wolves who come in in sheep's clothing. What do hungry wolves want to do in the sheep pen anyway? And so they put on some fluffy stuff, try to say, bah, my, what big teeth you have. Satan himself parades like an angel of light. These take scripture out of context, out of balance. They make texts serve their ends. Sometimes they come in and just say, I'm just asking questions. They poke holes at truth without any solutions, but they just create doubt. 
It's kind of cool to doubt until you're in the lake of fire. What are some telltale signs of a factious, divisive infiltrator who poses a clear and present danger to the beautiful unity of the truth in the local church? How do we know? Well, I want to close our time this morning by telling us what I'm not talking about. First of all, we're not talking about someone at your small group who has a different take on the interpretation of a passage, right? Two people having a conversation with their Bibles open. Hey, what does this mean? Oh, I, I think maybe it means this. What about these details? Infiltrator! <laughs> We're not talking about somebody who was sick last Sunday and missed the sermon about all the greetings that we all heard, who, who recognized that a greet one another with a holy kiss was a, a culturally specific form of a warm, affectionate greeting, and then comes in and starts kissing everybody, and we're like, ah, subversive, divisive. We all tend to do this, don't we? Uh, I just got clarity on a difficult passage of scripture. Now, I'm fully convinced of its meaning. And I start assessing the other Christians around me. Have they come up to snuff with the interpretation I just arrived at? Do they understand it? I'm going to pick on our students for a little bit this morning. They went away last weekend to winter camp. And they were taught from Galatians 5 on the differences between the deeds of the flesh, which are evident, and the fruit of the Spirit, that which is produced by the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And, and they got it grammatically correct. There is one fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is. And then love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. There's nine of them. Are there nine fruits? Or is there one fruit with nine facets? And, and they got it right. In, in fact, kudos to Jonathan Kelso, who drew up the T-shirt design. And some of you are wearing that shirt. I saw it this morning. And there's one piece of fruit. Good job. Grammatically, biblically correct. And I haven't heard any uh, of our students do this, okay? But, but if, for instance, one of our students, after getting that wonderful teaching last weekend, heard somebody inadvertently say, fruits of the Spirit. <laughs> it's not fruits, it's fruit. <laughs> All of a sudden, there's a, there's a difference if I hear someone inadvertently say fruits, I'm crying heterodoxy, false teaching, infiltrator, divisive. This is a person we have to keep our eye on, watch him, avoid him. He's trying to start a fruit salad faction in the church. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here. We're all growing. We're all learning. The infiltration in view is not defined by merely some doctrinal difference or an interpretational misunderstanding nor ignorance of some theological truth that others have already grown in. No, we're all growing in our knowledge of the Lord. No one is fully baked yet. We're all just kind of half-baked, and that's okay. Some of us have just met Christ, and there's a lot of raw batter that just went into the oven. We're growing together. The problem in view here is not an informational problem. It is a character flaw. It is a fatal character flaw, a problem in the heart of the divisive man. And it's important for us to sort of look at what are the warning signs of, of a divisive character or even to begin to look in our own hearts and see the seeds of this trait in ourselves and put them to death. Let me give you just a short bullet pointed list here. Someone is unteachable. Bible open together. What does God's word say? I see that. Not going there. The vice of person is an unteachable one. Uncorrectable. Hey, your behavior is contrary to God's word. Yeah, I'm not changing it. No, thank you. These are heart attitudes that come out ultimately, eventually, in a divisive person. Someone who loves to have a voice. What's really important to me is that my ideas get heard. Now, that's a sure sign of a seed of divisiveness. What happens when your voice isn't heard? What happens when you come up with new ideas and people get their Berean study Bibles out and they're checking what you say? Someone who loves to have followers, disciples, imitators, a fan club. Someone who's disappointed when people aren't following where you're going. 
people that love to wear their theological differences like a badge of honor. People who will pit Christians against each other. You're not looking for ways to be a peacemaker and find ways to get Christians to love one another. Yodia and Syntyche get along. No, you, you actually revel in the fact that Yodia and Syntyche are having a fight. Because then I can have my fights over here, I can build my faction, and no, we just don't really care about that. Or maybe you see in somebody, uh, someone who pits leaders against each other. Right? You, you go to one elder, you get one answer, you ask the question a little bit different way, get a different answer from another elder. Aha! Disagreement! I found a crack. I'm going to drive a wedge in that crack and split the leadership. People unwilling to be engaged with Bible open over critical issues. Spout their favorite verses, get their word in, get the last word on everything. Hey, will you sit down with me? That verse you used, can we just talk about that together and look at it? I got another verse. People that run to the periphery of doctrinal categories hang out on the edges. If you, if you think about the doctrine of any local church and the, and the elder's job is to sort of protect that circle of doctrine, even draw the circle of biblical doctrine that, that we're going to preach and proclaim and do the best we can. And look, we want that circle of doctrine that we proclaim to be the same circle that the Bible is. <laughs> and we're working to get it there. But there are people that don't like the big, fat center of juicy doctrine that's wonderful, feast for Christians. I want the edges. That thing over there that's edgy and maybe controversial and debatable, I want to go there. And then I'm looking over the edges beyond the fences into those fields beyond, and then I'm opening the gate, and then I'm going out there, and I'm taking people with me. Watch out for the guy that's always pushing on the edges. Another red flag is just any infatuation with what is new. I just read the hot new theological book. I just read something that I got exposed to that people around me have never seen before, and I want to share that. Now I have something to say that's intriguing, a, a new angle. Uh, people will listen to me and follow me because I'm not saying the same old things that everybody else is always saying. I got something new, and they haven't learned to wait, to, to give some new idea or new angle some shelf life and test drive it. By the way, you come across a new theological idea, sit on it. Read your whole Bible and see if it really fits. Live the Christian life a little. These are people who are not afraid to be wrong. They're not afraid before the Lord and God's people to sin. For there is no fear of the Lord, but only a love of self. You see the seeds of this in your own heart. You got to put it to death. And Christians, all Christians, love the local church, love the truth, love the glory of God, and become aware of this clear and present danger to the church. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your truth. Thank you for the ways that your truth unites. People who have never been around each other, people who have not tried to figure out what we have in common and be as like each other as we possibly can, all of a sudden have a unity around the truth because you have done a work in our hearts and you have united us together by faith in Christ. And we love to hear the voice of our shepherd. We love to hear the voice of our Savior and we love to do that together. And the more clearly and more thoroughly we hear your voice, we have unity with one another. That's the kind of unity we long for. God, would you protect it in our midst? Would you help us as Christians to be protectors of that sweet and precious unity around the truth in Christ? We ask it in Jesus' name.